Grace and mercy be multiplied to you in the knowledge of our God as we encourage one another uh, with the word of the Lord today. Um, let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, would you be our teacher now? Open our understanding that we may comprehend your word, that our heart will respond to your word, and may you be glorified. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18, Paul reads, But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as, as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself would descend from heaven with a cry of a command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. And then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we'll always be with the Lord. Therefore, Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Praise the Lord. Paul's heart was filled with hope whenever he thought about the Thessalonians. He found hope in their stands for the gospel amidst persecution. He found hope in their witness. He prayed that they will grow in love and that they will remain faithful and blameless. Paul also encouraged them to love one another, to love well, and to love in a way that drew people to Christ. And so when Timothy brought back the report to Paul, he noted that the Thessalonians were struggling with how to reconcile their understanding about the return of Christ with the death of fellow Christians. So the Thessalonians feared that believers who died before the return of Christ would somehow miss out. They would somehow miss out the great gathering of God's people that would occur at the end of human history. Also considering the ongoing suffering and persecution, these young believers were convinced, were convinced that 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 they have missed the rapture and they are now experiencing the day of the Lord. So the Thessalonians were building their end times theology on speculations rather than scripture. Paul was not content to add more speculation to their lives. He knew they did not need more questions. They needed answers. And so Paul had to address their confusion in three specific ways that I want to share with you. Number one, Christ is our hope in life and death. Christ is our hope in life and death. Three times in verses 13, 14, 15, Paul refers to believers who are asleep. Paul understood the source of the Thessalonians' grief and confusion. Paul likely was answering a question that had been raised before. What happens to Christians who died before the coming of Christ? So the word, the coming of Christ, is referred to the Greek word as parousia, the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Though they were strong in the faith, the Thessalonians, a misunderstanding had taken shape that believers who are asleep will not be raised with uh, will not be raised when Christ returned so believers who are asleep will not be raised when Christ returned there was a mis misunderstanding there so in other words some believed that those who lived to see the uh, those who lived to see the return of Jesus had an advantage while any christian 
who died before the parousia or before the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ will not experience the resurrection. And so the Greek word used for sleep here was a common term related to a physical sleep. Christian writers often use it as a metaphor to death or a metaphor for death. Jesus used the same image when describing Lazarus in John 11, 11, 15. While some have suggested Paul was referring to a transitional period between life and death, the context makes it clear that it was not his intention. He was referring to people who have died. So when Christians die, their bodies are asleep. The good news is that when believers die, their bodies go into the grave, but their spirit go directly into the presence of God. 2 Corinthians 5.8 Whereas for non-believers, their bodies go into the grave, but their spirit go immediately to hell. Luke 16, verse 22 to 23. Therefore, at death, your existence does not end. Your physical body goes to sleep, but your spirit continues to exist. And so one day your body will be united with your spirit in a glorification form. First John 3, verse 2. So for us as a believer, death has no final word. Thanks be to God. The Apostle Paul, so he comforts the Thessalonians to mourn or grieve the death of their, of their loved ones and friends who have died in the Lord. Look, it's okay to grieve. It's okay to mourn. It should be noted that Paul was not saying that Christians should not grieve. He was not saying that. Only that we do not grieve like those outside the faith who have no hope. God created us to experience pain and sadness, especially when we lose someone that we love. Even Jesus, he wept for the death of Lazarus. So grief is a natural human response to loss and death. So it is okay to grieve. But we grieve with hope. For us as a believer, we have the hope of eternal life. We recently sang a new hymn um, uh, a couple weeks ago that um, entitled, Christ, Our Hope in Life and Death. And the first stanza of that hymn um, articulates, What is our hope in life and death? Christ alone, Christ alone. What is our only confidence? that our souls to him belong. Who holds our days within his hand? What comes apart from his command? And what will keep us to the end? The love of Christ in which we stand. Number two, Christ is the hope of the resurrection. Christ is the hope of the resurrection. So Paul reminded the Thessalonians that one of the essentials of our faith is the conviction that Jesus died and rose again. And so, in fact, the phrase here may have been a part of an early Christian creed that would have been familiar to the Thessalonians. The death of Jesus on the cross paid the price for sin, while his bodily resurrection defeated death and give us hope beyond our own graves. In fact, those who died in Christ were already experiencing his presence. Look at verse 14 there. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so through Jesus, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. And so since God powerfully raised Christ from the dead, believers should understand that he has promised to do the same for them. Through Jesus, we accept God's offer of salvation and surrender our lives and our death to him. Because he is faithful to keep us, to keep his promises, we can be assured of 
two facts related to eternity, just as verse 14 states. We know that Christ will return. There's no doubt. He is coming back. Second, we know that when he comes back, he will bring with him those who have died. Those who have been redeemed through Jesus will be joined with Jesus at his return. That's what verse 14 says. He will, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. Those who have been redeemed through Jesus will be joined with Jesus at his return. In other words, the Apostle Paul is reassuring the Thessalonians, don't worry. Don't worry. For those who have died in the Lord will not miss out the glory of the coming of Christ. For God will bring them back with Jesus. So Christians who passed away before the parousia, before the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, are not a disadvantage. God will raise them from the dead just as he raised Christ. This is a good news. This should bring them comfort. And so this is an important doctrine for Christians to understand and embrace. As Paul told the Corinthians, the resurrection of Jesus is proof of our resurrection one day. 1 Corinthians 15. If his resurrection was a fraud, our faith will be empty and would be left with nothing to cling to. Just as it is stated in verse 9, we would be pitied more than anyone. But since Christ's resurrection is so real, it's real, we don't grieve without hope. We don't grieve without hope. Brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. For Christ is the hope of the resurrection. Number three, Christ is coming back. Christ is coming back, verse 15 to 18. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, we will not pre precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord will descend from the heaven with the cry of a command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. One, 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 one may ask, how can this be? How can this be? Paul answers in verse 15, says it. We declare to you this by the word from the Lord. A direct revelation from the Lord. The Thessalonians were informed fully about the day of the Lord's judgment. Look at uh, chapter 5 right there. It says, for you yourself, chapter 5, verse 2, for you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. In the night. They knew. They were well informed. But not the preceding event, which is the rapture of the church. So Paul revealed it as the revelation from God to him. And for it had been a secret. So the only reference of the rapture in Jesus' teaching is found in the Gospel of John, verse four, uh, chapter 14, verse 1 to 3. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself. That where I am, you may be also. What a reassurance, brothers and sisters. So the Thessalonians would understand when Paul said his teaching about the second coming were a word from the Lord. Paul's teaching about the parousia, the coming of the Lord, carried the authority of the Messiah. It was not the result of human speculation, but the divine revelation. Sharing anything else would have left the Thessalonians uninformed, as we saw in verse 13, about the truth. 
and would have done nothing to calm their fears about the eternal destiny of the deceased loved ones. So Christian hope in times of grief must be rooted in the truth of the gospel. So Paul's explanation of Christ coming back outlined a sequence of events. The first thing he addressed was the destiny of those who are still alive when Christ comes back. Verse 15 there. For this we declare to you by a word of the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, we will not precede those who have fallen asleep. So they will not precede those who have fallen asleep. Paul would certainly have understood that the timing of both his own death and cross return rested in God's hands. So he lived and spoke as if it could happen in his lifetime. As with all early Christians, he believed that the event was near. But also Paul was content with the idea that he might die before Jesus come back or before Jesus came back knowing his relationship with Christ was secure and so Paul explained that the Lord himself will descend from heaven verse 16 for the Lord himself will descend from heaven at his first advent in Bethlehem brothers and sisters Jesus came as an infant in humble ordinary circumstances aside from shepherds and later, a visit from the wise men, his birth was, uh, went mostly unnoticed. But when he comes again, oh, brothers and sisters, when he comes again, he will come with the power and glory that he deserves. When he descends, people will know that he has arrived. The king has come. It will be an event that is impossible, impossible to ignore or misunderstand. Next, the apostle noted that three loud sons will usher in Christ's return. First, he will come with a cry, with a cry of command. Or this can also be uh, translated as with a shout of a command, a shout. The Greek word here is a military term relating to a loud command. Christ will return as a conquering king. The nature of command is not given, but it could be an announcement of his return or order, maybe an announcement of his return or an order for the death, for the dead to rise. The archangel's voice and the trumpet of God also are closely associated with the shout of command, with the loud command. But whatever the case it is, whatever the case, this will not be a secret event. People will know. They cannot ignore. When Christ comes back, we will not ignore it. It will be an event that is sent to everybody. So the final sequence Paul revealed here was that the dead in Christ will rise first. As he noted in verse 15. So living Christians will not have an advantage here. Because those who have already died would actually ascend before the living to unite their souls with their glorified resurrection bodies. And so we should know that these deceased Christians remain in Christ. That is, that is even death, even death. Believers are not separated from the love of God, Romans 8. Paul's purpose here was to comfort the Thessalonians. And his words would have provided a tremendous peace for the Thessalonians. That the eternal destiny of their loved ones who passed away was secure. Was secure. Verse 17. And then he, and, and then we who are alive, then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up. Caught up with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. 
Paul had addressed the question of the dead in Christ, but he also knew that those who are still alive, those who are still alive will not miss the coming of Christ either. They will not miss that. In fact, they will experience they will experience a reunion that will last for eternity. They will be caught up, caught up together with the resurrected believers mentioned in verse 16. So the Greek word used here also can mean to seize or to carry off. The wording also indicates a, a, a very brief lapse in time between the raising of the dead and the rapture of the living. So the implication here is that the two events will likely be sudden, sudden, caught up, instant. This reunion will occur in the clouds. We know in the Old Testament that clouds often signify the presence and the glory of God. Also exemplify, it is also exemplified what we, we know the Israelites saw at the Mount Sinai in Exodus, verse 19, I mean chapter 19. But also Jesus associated his return with clouds in the Gospel of Mark, verse, uh, chapter 13. But also as he ascended into a cloud when, um, uh, just as he ascended into a cloud when going back to the Father. Acts 1, verse 9. But not only that, this reunion will also be with Jesus himself. They will meet the Lord in the air. This event represents the first ever, the first ever gathering of the entire body of Christ. With Jesus has had every believer from every nation, tongue, tribe, you name it, every people, like group people, every generation will come together to be with the Lord. And they will never, ever, ever leave his presence. And so Paul wanted to remind the Thessalonians, look, Jesus is coming back. Whether we are alive or not, he wanted to offer them an encouragement, in particular to those who are struggling with the question and uh, with the questions of the re the coming of Christ and the questions of grief. And so his truth would have provided comfort to his Thessalonians readers. So, Christ is our hope in life and death. Christ is the hope of the resurrection. And Christ is coming back. The last stanza of the hymn that I quoted earlier concludes, Unto the grave, what will we sing? Christ he lives, Christ he lives. And what reward will heaven bring? Everlasting life with him. And we will rise to meet the Lord. And we will rise to meet the Lord. Then sin and death will be destroyed. Completely destroyed. And we will feast in endless joy. When Christ is ours forevermore. Amen. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for this wonderful assurance that beats our heart to take comfort and to rest on your sustaining grace and your steadfast love. Maranatha, our Lord is coming. Amen.